my name is Erin Meyer. I'm the Sustainable Food Programs Coordinator at UC Merced. I conduct and coordinate all things food waste, food rescue, and several other things. Um, I wanted to begin by doing a brief land acknowledgement. Um, so we will pause to acknowledge all local and indigenous peoples, including the Yakuts and Miwok who inhabited this land. We embrace their continued connection to this region and thank them for allowing us to live, work, learn, and collaborate on their traditional homeland. Let us now take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all Yukats and Miwok people past and present. Thank you all. And with that, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to first introduce Alicia. She is my single food programs intern. She can say more about that. She's gonna be our moderator today. Hello, Alicia. Hello, Erin. I am a student at UC Merced and I'm a food rescue intern with the Bobcat Eats Food Awareness and Prevention Program. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and discussing your wonderful documentary gather. Um, so to start, let me get on the right page. Okay, so what was the community impetus in starting the People's Farm and has the community aided in its development? Um, let's jump in and have um, a day introduce themselves and then Sanjay as well and then we can get to that question. That's great. Cool, thank you. Go for it. Oh, yes, I, I, I was just gonna pass that question to Sanjay, but before I pass, I'm Ade Briones and I work for First Nations Development Institute. I'm Kiowa and Kochiti. I run the Native Agriculture and Food Systems Program and we were executive producers of Gather. Sanjay. Ade is far too humble. She's also, as people saw in the chat, she's dialing in from Lodi. She's deeply involved with a lot of California native issues. Um, her partner, Freddie Briones, is from the Big Valley Rancheria, uh, Pomo, California native. And Ade has been supporting the work of California tribes for a long time now. I'm, I'm, I'm Sanjay, I make movies. And it was a privilege for me to work with Ade and the First Nations Development Institute which in my own opinion is the premier native led nonprofit working on development, agriculture, arts, culture, human rights issues in Indian country. Um, you know, to Alicia's question, and I can address a couple of things with this as well. You know, when we were putting together the movie, the, the topic scope was wide, Native American food sovereignty, but a day was very specific from the outset that there's really no such thing as Native American food sovereignty. There's 574 federally recognized tribes, a number of California tribes, for example, that don't have that recognition yet, but each nation has its own history. Many have their own distinct languages, their own relationship with the creator creation stories and their food systems. And when it comes to Clayton Harvey's farm, the uh, People's Farm in De Bikia on uh, the White Mountain Apache tribe, that it wasn't ancestral farmland. I mean, Ade comes from one of the oldest farming communities in the entire world. But the Apaches, rather than kind of setting roots and building pueblos, they roamed according to the cycles of plants and plant blooms. And so they would forage and like look for very specific types of foodstuffs, but they did a, a little bit of, of farming in a way that I think a day and his people would, and her people would laugh at. They would just throw corn seeds into areas where they knew there was some kind of natural rainfall and they'd come back six months later and harvest the corn. So it's a long way of saying that Clay, Clayton's tribal history and their concept of food sovereignty, pre-contact, um, pre-contact with Anglo-Europeans and Spanish Europeans didn't involve farming. And so they've had to rebuild their food system from the ground up, you know, in the last hundred years or so. 
And part of that has been with the realization that the American supply chain system doesn't serve them. They're at the very, very end, whatever they're gonna get on trucks is gonna be really low quality at really high prices. And since they're no longer allowed to kind of follow the cycles of nature the way they did in the 1800s, they're forced to live on that reservation. They realized that they needed to have their entire ancestral food system fit on that reservation. And to do so, they actually needed to do something new for Apache people and start a farm. The farm itself is about 25 years old. Clayton started working there about 10 years ago, really turned things more organic and really began developing relationships with a lot of tribal entities like schools. Thank you so much. That was um, a really articulate and um, interesting answer. I um, Thank you. Um, what do you wish the public knew about the Apache people and agriculture? Well, I, I should throw something over to a day really quickly um, because I, I can only speak, um, you know, in the third person, but the, the picture behind the day is actually her family's traditional farmland. And, you know, maybe a day you could speak a little about, a little bit about what, you know, food sovereignty and your food system means to, to your people as a, as a, a segue. So appreciative, um, Sanjay and Alicia. Like, um, I'm not Apache, so I, that that question really should be directed at Apache people. But you know, we live in well, my people and Apache people are very close in proximity. So, <laughs> by default, um, you know, I hope my answer can be applied to them. But to your question, Sanjay, thank you. Yes, food sovereignty. You know, and I think farmers everywhere can sort of uh, relate to how um, the word food sovereignty often is not used by people who grow food. Sometimes you're just a farmer. Sometimes you're just a coach tea person. Sometimes you're just a patchy person. And um, interacting with your lands, growing your food, interacting with your animals or your community is just like a natural way of life. And so really when we see the word food sovereignty or food security these are like external views into like food systems right because the people who are really embedded in the food system who are growing the food they just see it as a way of life it's like a part of their being and i think that's one of the most beautiful things about just the field of food sovereignty is you have these very humble people who are who love plants, who love animals, who love their community so much that they dedicate their life to it. Um, it's only more recent where we get these silos of professionalism that we really see these titles being placed on people and not always by them. And so when we think about whatever food system we participate in, um, it, it is a way of life, even if it is just going to the grocery store to buy food, like that is a part of life. And so it's so important to remember that like when we're talking about these concepts, these are lived experiences by people who really like love growing plants, who love dealing with animals. And it's the same for indigenous people. We love our lands, we love our people, we love our traditional foods, and it's just a way of life. I think that really showed through the film too. <laughs> What are the common habits that our current food system and the history of colonization have subjugated onto indigenous practices? Alicia, would you mind repeating that again, please? Yes. What are the common habits that our current food system and the history of colonization have subjugated indigenous practices? Well, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of context and then, then I'll throw a question over to a day. I think it's, it's easy for us to forget that Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the vast majority, if not the entirety of the US, and then before that, the colonial economy came from land. Spanish colonizers were looking for gold, they were looking for silver, um, but the Anglo-European colonizers realized the value was in the topsoil. And that topsoil had value. Um, and insofar as people inhabited that topsoil, that wasn't as that wasn't so good for, for the the, the economy per se. 
They were trying to export cash crops like tobacco, like cotton to Europe to form markets there. And people who studied the Revolutionary War even and the French Revolution know that you know, one of the reasons why the US didn't really get involved with you know, post-Revolutionary War US skirmishes in Europe is because those were critical markets. And if the US supported you know, one side in France opposed, as opposed to the other, they might have shipping lanes cut off. And so it's important to, to note that a lot of native peoples you know, were forcibly removed from their land. They've had to reinvent the ecology that underpinned a lot of their food ways. Some places like Ades Pueblo, Cochiti, you know, just ended up getting surrounded by colonizers, Spanish, and then subsequent, you know, legions of Europeans. And so when it comes to impacts, I think while, while you know, there are things that a, a day should speak to, it's important to note that, you know, a lot of this was forced on, on Native communities. And I'll let a day speak to, like, like her, I mean, she works on this every minute of every day. Yeah, there's, there's some pretty, apparent distinctions and Sanjay um, did so well kind of let, setting up the stage. Like we have to remember that our ag modern day agricultural system is based on several premises. One is this idea of private property and two, this idea that man can control the environment. And we see both of those things play out in, in like the very basic concepts of what we think of farms, of what we think of as a farmer and what we think of as agriculture. Like we see when you're flying overhead, you can see the, the squares or the circles that delineate farms in this country. And all of those came because that was a way to distinguish like the settlers um, from indigenous people, right? Indigenous people didn't have fences or like land squared off. Indigenous people didn't call themselves producers, even though my community was one of the oldest agricultural civilizations. Um, when the colonists came, we weren't considered farmers or agriculturalists because the idea of American agriculture was the delineation or the boundary between what was civilized and what was not. The civilized folks could get land and could own land, the, civil, the uncivilized could not. And so the fact that indigenous people were not included in the very concept of agriculture in the beginning was purposeful. Like we, we were the land stewards, we were on the land and they needed reason to move us. And so agriculture was that distinction. We've never ever come away from that concept we still see, see it played out in a lot of issues when we look at agriculture now in California. You know, it's always like farms against the agri, the farms against the tribes, farms against the wild. And it's, it, these concepts are permeated in how we think about our food systems. The second way is when we look at what American agriculture systems need, it's this constant, supply of water. And so you see a lot of alteration of waterways. I don't think there's one drop in California that's not accounted for because every natural waterway is dammed at some point. It has gates and irrigation ditches and it's accounted for and people own that land. Now, now we have like a futures market on, on water, especially here in, in the Central Valley. So it's like, these are concepts that um, are very much the base of how we view food systems in America. And it's never really included indigenous people. And so that is something like we need to challenge and question at every opportunity because we there's so many indigenous people that not only have their traditional water, like traditional food ways, but we have like practices and stewardship um, you know, processes that are beneficial to everyone, not only in our region, but in our state and in this nation that could actually address some of the issues we're facing now. I think we definitely need to make our farming practices a lot more, more inclusive. Um, so kind of as a follow-up question, 
how commonplace is farming on reservations? So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there, Sanji, then I'm gonna pass it to you. So um, how common is farming on reservations? Again, every single community, tribal community, federally recognized or not, has a traditional food system. Like we wouldn't exist if we didn't know how to feed ourselves. And so like that system of food uh, creation and production sometimes doesn't, isn't farming. And it's not considered farming, but like you think of the Yurok in Northern California, or even um, some of the Central Valley folks, the Wakchumni, the, the Yulumni, the Tachi people, you know, they, they were dependent on like Tulare Lake and the fish that came from that lake, or some of the animals that came from the mountains, but that's not considered farming. And so when we ask that question, there are communities some of the, the largest farm in this country is located on a reservation. The Navajo, that Navajo Nation has the largest continuous farm in this country. Oral riddle popcorn comes from um, a Lakota reservation in North Dakota. So like there are communities that have extensive agribusinesses and like what we think of as a modern day farm, but every community has a traditional food system that um, sustain them. And so like, again, the word farming it sometimes is exclusionary. And so we, we at First Nations, we use the term food system. You wanna add anything, Sanjay? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that reframing that definition is, is critical because, you know, if you think back to pre-colonization of the Western hemisphere, yeah, there, there was farming all over the world and the, types of farming that were more industrial had to do with things that could be stored, like wheat, for example, or rice. But small scale food production was all left to localities. That's why you saw that if there was a famine that affected a certain valley, that famine would have long reaching effects. A lot of people would suffer, a lot of people would starve. But the first time you really see companies and nations investing in companies to form what we now call the supply chain was around the spice trade in the 1300s, the 1400s. Spices traditionally got to Europe by land and it took a long time and you couldn't get a lot and you couldn't make a lot of money. So the British government, the Dutch government basically invested in armadas in, in galleons and ships to go to try to go to the spice islands. They ended up hitting Turtle Island, the Western Hemisphere, the Caribbean, but they'd already got this notion that they could extract agricultural wealth from certain parts of the world and ship it to areas where there was a much higher demand. You know, if you're looking at the Spice Islands, there are some islands that are covered with cloves. I'm sure every kid on that island is sick of the taste and the smell of cloves, but the Dutch would basically harvest all of that, send it to Europe. And to do that, you needed labor. It was too expensive to bring labor on ships with you all the way to these far flung corners of the world. So the first thing that people tried to do set forth by the doctrine of discovery and the, and the approval of the Catholic church at the time was to enslave local people. And that happened here too. Just there weren't enough people here on Turtle Island and that necessitated the slave trade from Africa. So it's, it's important to note that this whole economy of growing something in some place or fishing for something in some place and then shipping it to another market where there's more value that's created a huge imbalance in the world and lastly like during covid for example we saw that people that didn't have a lot of economic power didn't end up having access to food and supplies People with economic power could always go to a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's or order from Amazon Prime. And that whole idea of certain people having more power in the food system based on money is pretty new in the span of human history. I mean, we all had food sovereignty from cultures that we used to come from. It's only been this move in the last few hundred years, particularly the last 60 to 80 years, that people who don't eat the food and don't touch the food are the ones who are making the most money off that food. Okay. 
how are food systems and culture correlated? That, that's like, I, when I, you ask that question, I think of like an infinity symbol <laughs> because, um, you know, food perpetuates culture, culture perpetuates food. And what's so important about what um, Sanjay said is that when the barrier or the access requires money, that means that those without money will have um, a hard time accessing not only food, but then the culture that it perpetuates. And so you see a lot of people trying to, um, you know, figure out different ways of moving resources outside of money. And you have all kinds of informal economies that have popped up in response to um, not having enough financial or cash resources. And so like that's, you know, that's something American food, the American food system does really poorly at is that, you know, making the correlation between culture and food, you know, like we see all the work in like the food system focus on nutrition, caloric intake, food prices, all of these very sterile measures of how well our food system is working says nothing about culture. But then when you talk about to indigenous people or even um, people in the African-American community or Latino people, like our food is like the connector. We all sit at the table and we laugh and we, we have certain foods at, at ceremonies or at baptismals or, you know, family gatherings because we see this very direct connection between what we're eating, how we socialize with one another and how we build community. That's not re always reflected in the American food system where everything is measured in like in numeric units from money to ca ca caloric intake. And now we see regenerative agriculture with like the number of carbon atoms that are being circulated in the food system. And all of these things um, I think are poorly correlated in the American food system. But all you have to do is sit at the table of any indigenous community and the the connection between food and culture is apparent. If not, if not there, you know, all you have to do is listen to a story about like indigenous creation and food comes up in those stories. Or you like not there, you just go to an indigenous community and ask them what the traditional foods is. And the culture is always connected to the, the food of that community. Sanjay, you have anything to add? Only a tiny bit. I mean, all those of us who are not indigenous, our ancestors came from someplace. And chances are, whether it was 50, 100, or 400 years ago, those ancestors had been in those communities for hundreds, if not thousands of years. They developed a pretty deep ecological knowledge of those environments, those food systems, and some pretty deep cultural correlation with the foods they were eating, whether it was in harvest, whether it was preserved. Most people know that traditional religions all had very, very deep food cultures. Now the problem is, and this is really a, a direct reflection of politics in the United States, an American food story was written for almost everybody in this country except the earliest British settlers. And everyone has had to conform with that food story. And it's not like those early British settlers really have many, the defendants have, many, have much contact with ancestral villages or their ancestral practices. But essentially, we've come to believe that our American food story is based on what we can get from the supply chain. And that means what we can get from grocery stores, what we can get from fast food and big restaurant chains. And that's not the American food story. And the, the food system is pushing more and more to environmental and, you know, kind of like community solutions that have been in Indian country here on the land in which we all inhabit for thousands of years. And I think that's where the interest in gather is, because even though we don't really make it clear for non-native audiences, 
I think those of us who are non-native, myself included, see a lot of the solutions to American problems. The solutions are here and the solutions have been practiced in Indian country. They need to grow according to the terms of people in, in Indian country, but everything that we want to do, you know, has an example right now in a, on, a, on a tribal nation. Thank you. I, I would just follow up just very quickly. Um, I think again, this is another important point to remember is that like America, like American food or the American food system is often used as a tool of assimilation for not only indigenous people, but people in, in general. I mean, there's tons of food study research that look at how like the American diet and like white sauce and white bread have used to like come to standardize the diet of people in America, no matter where you come from, it was used in like boarding schools to ensure that indigenous children would then go home and feed their families like acceptable, acceptable American food. And so part of the, co the correlation between culture and food is that um, it's often used in the opposite way as a way to assimilate people into American culture rather than support the cultures that the food comes from. So I think a great follow-up question, you were saying that every culture kind of surrounds itself at the dinner table and has a cultural history with their food systems. And as a follow-up, Erin had this question, why the name gather? And is it a reference to gathering food, to gathering community, something else? That, that's a great question. One of, our, one of our other native producers came up with that title because, you know, again, we're trying to make a film about a topic that doesn't really exist. You know, we wanted to make a film that all native people could really resonate with. So we couldn't make it too Apache. We couldn't make it too Lakota. We couldn't make it too Yurok. And gather seemed to be a word in his own kind of experience that has a cultural significance, even if people don't use that same word, a cultural significance across indigenous communities, not just in North America, but, but globally. I think Erin has a question. Yeah, I just wanted to leave a little bit of room in case there are other answers to that. I wanted to read Elwin's question in the chat. Um, the big issue here in Central Valley is the limited water supply, which is due to the Endangered Species Act. With less water, food production is limited or reduced as well. Did you encounter this problem as well? And how did you solve this problem? That, that's a great question. And I, I should say that, you know, I grew, I grew up, you know, in the East Bay and my dad was deeply involved in the farming community in the Central Valley. Um, so I can kind of un understand that on many levels. I think the crux of the issue is reframing because we're not talking about food production for residents of the Central Valley. We're talking about food production that's going to be shipped all over the world. And as Californians, you've seen many examples of, of, of ways in which California's water has been shipped overseas in the form of almonds, in the form of pomegranates. So if we look at the definitions that we begin to explore and gather and the environmental conditions that are really reorienting the food system, most of the solutions come from growing things according to many different environmental conditions of specific locations. For example, the Tennessee River Valley was one of the most productive places on the Eastern seaboard until it was flooded with the interest of hydroelectric power. There's a lot of cases where the American political system has destroyed incredibly fertile land and has promoted farming in areas where it thought water was an infinite resource, like on the upper Klamath Basin in Oregon, like in the Central Valley where water policy 
you know, necessitated in crop selection like cotton, necessitated draining of aquifers. So we're at a stage where it's not just one thing that is stressing the food system. The weight of the entire supply chain is putting stresses at many different places. I mean, one of the biggest issues uh, with, with like the fish supply chain is energy and cold storage and developing ways, again, like in California, to produce enough to satisfy markets that are far away. And we need to develop a more sustainable definition of markets and how to support populations within a certain square mile area. I mean, we know that the whole world shouldn't rely on California. I mean, it's almost not fair to Californians, you know, in the long term for that to happen. So a lot of these issues require a lot of deep thought, but there's a lot of, of variables that are really affecting it, not just one or two things in my own opinion. Yeah, and I would just add, I think we're like, I don't know, in one of the, the drought, I mean, we had in California, I live in Lodi, so we had a drought in 2012 to 2016, and then we had this gush of water and then 2020, because of El Nino, in 2021, we see like in, intense drought. Um, and in some cases, like we we haven't seen even in 2016 and 2012. So I think like there's so many factors that go into the water shortage um, that, that are beyond just the Endangered Species Act, you know, and, and tribal communities aren't allocated any water, you know, so that I think, there's not only the issue of drought, who owns and who is allocated those water rights and how it's managed, but it um, also speaks to what Sanjay is saying, like the values of the state and the country on um, what, what is important, right? And food sales, food markets, as Sanjay is saying, are, are based on like the policy management of water is really important, far more important than the indigenous people who come from those lands, far more important than the animals that depend on these water systems, far more important than the small and medium sized farmers who, who probably get the shaft of, of the, the, the management of water in the most, one of the most productive places in the world. You know, lastly, I think it's really easy for it to be framed as kind of an us versus them, you know, uh, farmer versus progressive versus indigenous. But at the end of the day, these issues are all about economics. And all of the people that are involved are the, all the people that are suffering, the various constituents that are pitted against one another, you know, are all gonna lose it actually doesn't matter what the solution is to the political establishment. There is a solution that will benefit them and that's a solution that's gonna happen. And so, you know, you see the most powerful movements in America being the ones that, that gather power amongst the base. Uh, traditionally people that have had a lot of hostility or have grown to hate each other for reasons that nobody can remember. And I think that's the case in California as well. With, with water policy, for example, we were, you know, we had some great panels with, with folks out in, in Ventura, and indigenous, you know, food sovereignty experts there. And the water usage in the Central Valley and in other areas has created this sense amongst Californians in general that water is unlimited. And, and when that happens, you know, forest management begins to be, begins to be you know, forgotten. Like the Klamath River, you know, those dams basically support the entire watershed the, of, of, of Sami and, and the Yurok people. And when that water is dammed, that watershed begins to experience deeper levels of drought. And when that happens, you know, fire becomes a much bigger reality. So, you know, I, I think from, from the, the collective standpoint, there needs to be a deeper sense of, you know, of, of management, stewardship, et cetera, led by indigenous people. I think as a follow-up question, what is the biggest threat to the preservation of native food traditions? So one, 
again, like Sanjay said, would be water. I think the issue of water is critical, not only to indigenous people, but to everybody like who has access to water. Um, you know, all of our traditional food systems, whether we live in the desert or whether we're dependent on the Klamath River is all based on natural cycles of not only water, but the animals and the people that migrate that follow those water rays. And whenever you have an alteration of water, you're gonna alter the ecosystem. And you know, so water is a critical issue. The other is like a recognition of indigenous people. When you don't think there's any indigenous people living, there's no reason to pay attention or no reason to ask like how to be supportive. So like the invisibility of an indigenous issues is really critical. And we see that play out when we talk about like hunting and fishing and gathering rights. Like if, if they're not recognized as a stakeholder group because nobody knows they exist, you know, those rights become very tenuous and, you know, it, it becomes really hard to participate in a traditional food system. And the last one is like our children. I, in my organization, we support indigenous food projects throughout the country. And we consistently hear that I can grow traditional corn, I can grow all, I can gather all this traditional food, but my kids won't eat it because they want hot Cheetos. Because like there is such, there, there's a colonization of American taste buds, not just of indigenous children, but all of our children. When I was in school to getting an LLM in food and agricultural law, like we were recruited as lawyers for taste companies and all they did was like find the perfect taste for food that would get people addicted. It's almost like here comes the flavor company and then the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical company would come after them. Like it's such a market to find that perfect balance between salt and sugar salt, sugar, and fat. And so like it's dominating our taste buds. And if our kids no longer know what our food tastes like, they no longer want it. And so that's the second one. Third one. Sanjay, will you add? Oh, I was going to say something back to, to Alwyn's point. I take it that Alwyn's probably a water systems expert. And one of the things that I, I realized, you know, through the production of Gather is that each local native tribe is fighting for specific policies. And they might be your neighbors. Um, they might be you know, living in the same watershed, living in the same ecosystems, but chances are their viewpoint of what the environment needs in terms of policy stretches out a lot further than local governance, local politicians, local businesses tend to frame problems in. I mean, there's a, the, the idiom of seven generations, but it's true. Native tribes aren't just looking at what's gonna happen in one year or five years or 10 years. Most of us, if we get economic opportunity some, in some other location in the US, we'll move. If there's a, a better place to raise our kids, we'll move. But you guys will have seen and gather and will know from your own studies that native peoples are so tied to the spiritual traditions of their land that they don't move. And so when they're talking about environmental policy, chances are they recognize that their descendants from multiple generations are going to be experiencing the effect of what we do today. So almost as an exercise, it's really worth going to websites of, of local tribes, looking to see what types of policies they're pushing and they're fighting for and you know, becoming their allies because chances are they've thought about these issues with a much longer horizon than the rest of us. That's what I saw in native communities all over the country. And it was really astounding to understand that they're not only looking at the, the health of their communities, but they understand their role in supporting the stewardship and the health of, of all communities. Even those ones like in New York City that don't really think about things and don't necessarily care about these issues. I also think that we're we're not um, looking at the at, when you when you talk about native people do do you we have to include the people that have been marginalized even further by their own tribes like there are a lot of people that are separated from their tribes separated from the 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 economy you know like there's there are those that are on the res 
and have moved away from the reservation, they're, they find themselves in the Central Valley and they're not uh, affiliated to any tribe. And that's even a, a bigger disparity for those that are like marginalized, like in that, in that sense. I'm working right now on an effort that's trying to bring all the tribes together, whether they have enough bloodline, if they're registered or not registered, because the, the issue remains that, that the culture has been basically stripped. We are trying to identify with who we are. And, and I agree so much with the day because it's the truth. You have food that has been introduced or basically mitigated in a way that if you don't assimilate, and you don't get the don't get the uh, recognition. So we hide. We've hidden behind names. Uh, you know, I'm Hispanic, and I know good and well. My father was born in 1908, and he died in 90, uh, at 96 years of age. And the one thing he kept telling me is, there's so many people out there that are hiding behind Hispanic last names, surnames, when they are actually native, but they could not come out and say that they were native. So there's a deeper a, a more intrinsic uh, loss just and it's all connected to our culture food the way we we carry ourselves our water everything that we are has been has been stifled so when you have these conversations and you say that it's just just that it's not enough to know I, there's so many other layers of who we are and i and i just ask that you that that we have that sensitivity and understanding that there are folks out there right now that cannot even come out of their shell because they just have been shamed into recognizing who they are. And, 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 and the food that we, when we gather, it's so important to us because it's inherently how we were able to talk to each other, how we were able to tell what the days were like, how we were able to, to understand our history, how we connected and food was just part of that. In a day, I agree, you know, how do you tell your kids to eat healthy when they are already sold out on what we've given and allowed to happen across the board. Yeah, I think one of the stories of the Central Valley that very few people really understand or even heard is that when we think of some of the largest agricultural land plots or farms, in the Central Valley, the first migrant agricultural workers for these farms were indigenous tribes. You know, they would, their land got overtaken and I wanna say outright stolen. And then they were forced to work, work these lands either as slaves um, or they were removed from their communities and they had, were forced to participate in the cash economy because they had no homes, they were like homeless. And so like the first wave of migrant farmers in California were California native people. And there's a reason you don't see these tribes listed on, on maps in, in some of the most fertile agricultural grounds in all of America. They're, you know, they're either pushed way close to the mountains or they're pushed way down south or way up north. There's not, there's this whole gap in California where there's no tribes listed, but that's not because they don't exist. It was because they were forced to participate in the beginnings of an agricultural food marketing system that would eventually swallow up every single piece of land that any indigenous person had connection to. We do have Thule River who kind of like held it down and you know there's a lot of tragedy there and so like the Central Valley is you know when you go to a gathering with California native people all the basket weavers the large majority are going to come from the Central Valley despite the fact that you don't see tribes there so it's like there's this hidden population all up and down 99 all up and down that five corridor um, and very few people know about it. Thank you for sharing that because it, it's uh, it's kind of like a eye opener for me. You know, I've been meeting with so many people and their stories. It just it it hurts me. It hurts me to hear the stories. You know, and and to know that you know they're trying to recollect. You know, my my strong point is always storytelling. How do how do you take a picture or give someone a voice through an image so they could share their hurts? How do you how do you 
how do you exemplify that through words, through song, you know, through the through the colors, through through the artistry. And and then when you do, you know, it it takes a lot of courage to come out and start sharing some of those stories. And my my goal is to bring light to those stories so that so that that's part of the enrichment of our of our, our legacy here in California. I don't want the people to be forgotten. I don't want anyone to be marginalized. I don't want anyone to be put away and 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 said that they didn't happen. So for your recognition, I honor you for that because it's it's so important, you know, to to take an opportunity to to say, yeah, you, we didn't, we were here. You know, we were here, you know, we were here. And and what we're talking about is almost like retrospect after the fact. We were here, we were already cultivating. We were already conscious of the land, how to, how to make sure that it, it would be uh, equitable for all because that was the, the, the goal. And now we're in disparity in the land that's the richest, one of the richest bread baskets of the world, you know, and we're, and we're still living in disparity and it, and and it's bigger than just not having enough food it's like the quality of the food and the food that we're giving our children so it's kind of crazy but thank you for that space the film does a great job in showing how food sovereignty can be healing what inspired this idea i think that's for a, a day you know we we just we as filmmakers, we saw it, you know, everywhere. And I don't think you can really separate the, the notion of healing from food sovereignty, particularly because like, as you saw in the movie, when food was destroyed, that was a direct attack on culture. And so reconnecting with food is reconnecting to culture, is reconnecting to identity. But um, I think Ade can probably speak to that uh, much more powerfully. Yeah, well, food sovereignty and healing. I mean, those are two very heavy concepts, but when we think about um, some of what was explored in the film, the disassociation from land, the disassociation from community, the disassociation from culture, um, you know, all of these pressures on one person or one community can be very overwhelming. And one of the only ways you can demonstrate your resistance is to eat the same foods your grandparents ate, to understand and to like actually acquire traditional foods, um, to eat the buffalo, to eat the corn is like its own form of not only resistance to what America wanted us to become, but our, our form of remembering who we are. And so I think anybody who's rooted in their identity and rooted in their community and rooted in their history, whether it's tragic or not, is um, it has better odds at being a healthy person than not. And our ancestors knew that. And so when they were moved from, when Cherokee people were moved from the Southeast to Oklahoma, the women carried the seeds with them. When, you know, California people were moved to like inland to reservations, they carried abalone with them. I mean, so it's like our foods are the connection to everything we need. It may be like one little seed or one little abalone shell, but it's everything we need to remember who we are. And that in itself is like priceless. It's, it's, it's healing in itself. Gather also shows how integral fishing is to the native community. Has the future of salmon fishing gotten any brighter since the release of the film? That, that's a great question. You know, the, as people might know, the, the, the four dams on the Klamath River were slated for destruction and demolition um, after the film was completed. But there are several examples that the Klamath River tribes have, have really looked at. Um, there's a few dams that were removed off of uh, coastal salmon waterways in um, Washington. And experts thought it would take seven to nine years, perhaps, for those salmon to repopulate. 
but they found that the repopulation happened within a year and a half. And so there's a lot of hope for the, the rewilding of rivers. But I, I think it should be noted, like as Day mentioned, there's, there's waterways and lake systems in California that no longer exist. Um, you know, all of California's river systems, the Russian River, et cetera, had massive, you know, schools of fish. Um, the, the bay was full of salmon during salmon runs. And so I think it's a, it's a larger question to figure out how California as a landmass can return to its relationship with the ocean. I mean, some scientists have, 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 have hypothesized and maybe even demonstrated that a lot of the fertility in the Central Valley comes from hundreds, if not, th I mean, thousands of years of nitrogenous deposits from fish and amphibian carcasses. So the land of California always had a relationship with the ocean through its waterways, but that's something that, you know, seems so foreign in the, in the current landscape. How can we better educate and engage children on the value of native foodways and farming? One, for sure, I think indigenous kids need to know what the real history of this country is. Like it wasn't, we get fed, even I got fed, like the idea that, oh, we all were very happy and we sat down and had a turkey dinner and we were like happy. <laughs> and that just does a disservice to indigenous people because our children grow up not understanding where the conflict and like the tension comes from. Like when, when our history is like glazed over, indigenous kids are the ones that bear the burden of that accurate history and the inaccuracies, inaccuracies that are told in classrooms. So like teaching kids that like indigenous people exist teaching them the names of actual people that live in their communities. There's not one place you could go in this country that doesn't have an indigenous tribe attached to it. Um, even if people think they're all wiped out, there's probably an indigenous lineage still in existence in any community in America. And kids need to know that. They don't need to know that like, oh, in indigenous or Indian people we're 500 years ago. No, we're, we're here today. And there's so many resources on online to teach that. So the story of Thanksgiving needs to be challenged. And, um, you know, like, it's not all bad. Like, there are some very beautiful stories about, like, partnerships and, like, cooperation between Indigenous people and outside communities. When we look at COVID, Indigenous people not only like vaccinated their own communities at higher rates than the rest of the country, they, they vaccinated the communities that surrounded them at those same rates. And so it's not like we're insulated and we're not part of the, the American landscape and the American fabric. We're here, we exist. We have a story to be told. We have a history to be embraced. That's just as valid as the history that that the glazed history of like Thanksgiving and like Squanto and, you know, Pocahontas, those, those are not very accurate and they're pretty damaging, but there's ways we can tell our children the real history of who we are. And, you know, indigenous people are part of that history. Sanjay? Well, I'm 100% with the day. How has COVID impacted these nations? We heard that the cafe was closed via Eat for the Planet podcast. Has it since reopened? The cafe is located on one of the hardest hit communities in the entire United States, White Mountain Apache. And so they've actually kind of been in a full lockdown for public gathering places, indoor public gathering places. Um, but that's, you know, that said, unlike most Western businesses, you know, Nephi's Cafe is tribally owned. So it's not like he has to worry about um, loss of, of his property. 
So they're they're looking at reopening late spring, early summer as the health department uh, allows. Since the release of the film, have organizations worked closer with food sovereignty? We're trying. There are ways, you know, there's a difference between food security and food sovereignty. So we're trying to move the needle more towards food sovereignty and slowly, <laughs> it's happening slowly. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, I, I, I would add that, you know, a lot of tribal nations were hit very hard by COVID, obviously on the health side, but also they're at the very end of supply chains. And so food systems, food delivery was drastically affected. And for a lot of folks, especially those in our film, you know, it's been an opportunity to really accelerate the, the adoption of more food sovereignty practices. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we can do, you know, to, to support Native communities. Obviously, a huge thing that happened was the, the confirmation of Congresswoman Deb Holland to be the Secretary of the Interior. But rather than just looking at these big national victories, again, you know, look at what local tribes are doing, figure out ways to become friends, allies, invite, as you guys have done today, thank you guys, invite more local indigenous people, members of tribal nations like Ade and others to come and speak about hyper-localized issues so that you can directly get involved with their work. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for, you know, your the opportunity to, to, to be on the Zoom call with you. Um, I'm also hoping that you guys can connect with Ade and her work at First Nations and her work with California Natives. Um, so, so thank you. Um, that is, I think, an excellent place to wrap it up, talking about victories and opportunities. Um, it's a very positive note. So for sake of time, I wanted to thank all of you um, for being here, for listening, for watching the film, um, Sanjay and Ade for filling us in and informing us and inspiring us. Um, it's been a beautiful conversation today. and. I'm sure, oh, thank you so much for adding the Instagrams and everything. Um, I'm sure there's so many other resources we can learn from and explore. So if you have any of those, I can um, send those out as well. After this, I will go ahead and put our recording on YouTube and then I'll send up a follow-up follow -up email, which will contain that recording as well as any resources we might want to include. Um, I agree, Alvin and Ade should definitely connect. Um, there's some interesting stuff happening in chat right now. Um, definitely seeds of good. So thank you all um, and have a fantastic night. Thank you. Take care, everyone. It's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. A really great presentation. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you.